Most people who use a computer don't pay very much attention to the operating system. It's there, it works, as long as it keeps going, that's just good enough. In fact, you probably wouldn't be all that shocked to learn that just under a little under half of casual users can even tell you with any degree of certainty what OS their computer is running. Really? Half? <laughs> It's usually Windows or Mac OS, but when it comes down to the individual release name or number, it just isn't important to anyone who isn't a nerd. Of the minority who do even know what they're running, an even smaller number realize that just because your system comes with an OS, it doesn't mean you have to keep it that way. It's true, just because your computer is sold with Windows, you shouldn't feel stuck with it forever. There are countless alternatives out there, and many of them are free. But what if you're the kind of person who doesn't trust anybody? What if you're convinced that every major corporation is quite literally the work of the devil, but you still want to be able to spread the good word of the Lord and use your computer while doing it? Well, that, my friend, is a very specific situation. So what you could do is spend many years of your life making your own operating system. And if you're sitting there thinking, no one's going to do that, Simon, then you're mistaken. Quite a few people have tried, but one of the most interesting and controversial was undoubtedly Terry Davis, a man whose true technical and coding genius was rivaled only by his questionable views and questionable life choices. So who was he? What did he do? How did one man create a fully functional operating system good enough to become known throughout the tech community? Well, take out your thumb drives, uninstall Windows XP. <laughs> I can't believe some people still run Windows XP. If you run Windows, what's going on? What's going on? And get ready for the inexplicable phenomenon that is Temple OS. Who was Terry Davis? Okay, so before he became the somewhat questionable legends we know about today, Davis, to the surprise of nobody at all, started his life as a shy, introverted, computer-obsessed, stereotypical nerd. It's a shock, I know. So. Born on December the 15th, 1969, and growing up during the 70s, he was one of the lucky people who got to experience the true explosion of the home computer market as it happened, rather than having to view it retrospectively through vintage computer channels on YouTube like most of us have to now. Now, the thing is, Davis was not simply prepared to let the world of computing go wherever it wanted, just dragging him along behind it. He wanted to shape the future. In spite of being born seventh of eight children, an environment that doesn't usually lend itself to an abundance of spare cash, he was able to get his hands on the original Apple II through a program for gifted students at his school in Wisconsin. By the time he was 13, he had not only moved on to the Commodore 64, but also taught himself assembly code, an incredibly impressive achievement for someone who was just 13. Now, for those of you who don't know, and such knowledge is becoming more and more niche as time goes on, because, I mean, hardly anybody writes their own software anymore, assembly language is about as low level as it gets. Rather than using a cross-platform language to provide basic instructions to the computer, a much easier but more creatively limiting process, those who can write assembly code are basically able to communicate directly with the CPU. Is it far more powerful? Yes, absolutely. Is it insanely complicated, unforgiving, and difficult to debug? Also, yes. Perhaps even more impressively, this was something he achieved in his spare time. Whilst teaching himself to be a master coder, he was also busy obtaining a master's degree in electrical engineering from Arizona State University, an achievement he completed in 1994. But that was not all. He was also holding down a full-time job. In 1990, Davis started working for Ticketmaster. Ticketmaster's been around since 1990? Holy shit! As a low-level VAC systems programmer. While this might sound like a standard entry-level position for anybody with Terry's interests to take, the term low-level has nothing to do with the position's complexity. In this case, the term low-level refers to the type of code that he was working with. Whereas high-level code works on top of pre-existing infrastructure, low-level code is much more complex and controls the machine's most basic but essential functions. There is a lot more to it than that, but Ooh, we're going to hit the tech jargon quite hard later, so a simpler explanation will do for now. After spending four years making sure that Ticketmaster computers worked as well as they should, Davis was moved to a different department where his electrical engineering skills could be better leveraged. For the next two years, he worked on designs for ticket scanners and other such hardware, although it is unknown if any of this was ever built. At the time, the problem that Davis had was that he was not really being challenged on an intellectual level. So he, as well as embarking on several other projects, such as a physics simulator, began trying to get work in one of the more interesting government agencies, such as the CIA or the FBI. 
In what would perhaps turn out to be one of the greatest losses that these departments ever experienced, none of these attempts would ever come to fruition. For a while, though, Davis was fairly convinced that they would. Whenever he was outside, he began to notice that he was often surveilled by men in suits. For a few weeks, he put this down to the fact that he'd been looking for work with some top secret agencies. I mean, after all, it made sense that if the CIA were interested in taking him on, then they might take a look at what he got up to in his day to day life. What he, and indeed no one else at the time, thought was that this was the first of many manic episodes that Davis would experience throughout his life. Quickly, the paranoia began to grow, and Davis knew, just knew, that he had to get out of town. After jumping into his car and just driving, he began to hear a strange voice talking to him through the car's radio. Now, although raised in a strict Catholic family, Davis was, for most of his early life, a staunch atheist, believing his lifestyle to be too materialistic to coexist with religious doctrine. As he listened to the voice on the radio, the voice telling him that he must head to Texas in order to be safe, he knew, he just knew, that this was the voice of God. The start of Davis's direct communications with God were, shall we say, equal parts confusing and tumultuous? Upon arriving in Texas, he himself claimed to have dismantled his car in search of tracking devices before disposing of the keys and wandering off into the desert. If it were not for the fact that he was spotted by an officer of the law and transported back towards civilization, his story might have ended right there. Still, you know, God works in mysterious ways, and after telling Davis that the officer was in fact trying to abduct him and he should jump out of the moving car, a programming genius ended up in hospital with a broken clavicle and a psychiatric observation order. Initially, the doctors believed Davis to be bipolar, but he was eventually diagnosed with schizophrenia, something that would not only cause Davis problems going forward, but would eventually lead to his demise. After a fairly eventful stay in hospital, during which Davis is reported to have thrown a chair through a window, attempted to steal a truck, and just generally made a nuisance of himself while trying to escape, he was eventually able to either manage or conceal his symptoms well enough to get a release. It certainly seems that some of his more problematic delusions had faded, at least for now, but one thing that never left him was this connection to God. From the moment he left the hospital, he was searching for signs of divinity. In an interview with Motherboard, he says, in the Bible, it says, if you seek God, he will be found of you. Now I was really seeking, and I was looking everywhere to see what he might be saying to me. And what God was saying was very simple, if not exactly sane. God wanted Davis to build the third temple. This, though, would be unlike any other temple before or since. This temple would take the form of an operating system that would keep Terry Davis busy for the rest of his life. Now, as you may not be completely shocked to learn, Davis had actually had a crack at making his own OS before, but because of all his ongoing projects, it got shelved and temporarily forgotten about. After trying and most usually failing to make a 3D milling machine, a device that would have been fair to CAD design and then be left to create a complete 3D object, he dusted off the old code and got to work. God wasn't going to let Davis get on with it all by himself, though. There were many strict specifications that he had to adhere to. Furthermore, although Terry had attempted a similar project in the past, he alleged that God had told him that he must start from the very beginning. Now, before we get into the various notable aspects of Davis's operating system, the first iteration of which was simply called J Operating System, it's perhaps worth taking a brief moment to acknowledge just what a gargantuan undertaking this was. Now, when big companies develop a new OS, they've got hundreds, sometimes thousands of individuals working on the project. In addition, most operating systems nowadays are built on the shoulders of their predecessors, so coders do at least have a jumping off point. Davis made everything from scratch, and we mean everything. He invented his own programming language, built his own compiler, and developed the kernel from the ground up. Now, we know this is a tech tutorial video, but it's probably worth explaining just a few things as we go along. I'm not going to go into huge detail, you probably don't want that, but compiling your own compiler, a specialized program that takes human-written code in a high-level programming language like C or Rust and translates it into a lower-level machine code or assembly language that a computer's processor can actually execute, is usually the job of dozens of people. We were unable to find any other examples of a single individual creating something of such complexity. Of course, they're really wasn't any other choice. Had he chosen to use a pre-existing compiler such as GCC or LLVM, then he probably would have had to limit himself to pre-existing programming languages rather than creating his own, which was Holy C, by the way, a derivative of C. For 10 long years, he worked on his temple until in 2005 the first release was ready for his adoring public, and the response was 
mixed, let's say. In keeping with the God-inspired theme, Davis had worked tirelessly to not only make it clear that the project was a work of God, but also to ensure that nobody forgot it. Technically speaking, it was pretty good for its time, or at least pretty good for what it was. Temple OS was a 64-bit operating system capable of taking advantage of multi-core CPUs, working with 3D graphics, gaming, and even on a moderately powerful system, booting in just a couple of seconds. The thing is, once it was up and running, the things you could actually do with it were quite strange, let's say. God, and by extension Davis, believed that the only communication anyone using Temple needed was a direct line to God, and to that end, the system did not include any networking capabilities whatsoever. Still, you could talk to God through the cunning use of the Oracle game. Have a question? All you need to do is climb the mountain, pose that question to the burning bush, and God himself would respond. Actually, the program worked by using a pseudo-random number generator to pick various words and phrases from the Bible, but seeing as how God was in charge of the whole OS and indeed the universe, it was basically the same thing, wasn't it? Of course. Davis claimed that you essentially got out what you put in. If you wanted God to really make some effort with his response, you would have to please him in some way before playing. Perhaps you might create a genuinely funny comic, play some music by the Beatles, allegedly God's favorite band, or shine up your BMW, God's favorite car, until it was visible from heaven or something. Now, if you're feeling spiritually fulfilled and just wanting to do a little regular gaming, then you could play the Temple Racing Game or take a flight with the inbuilt flight simulator, all hand-coded by God's messenger himself. Of course, there were limitations. God was not into high definition or complicated sound design, so the system ran natively at 640x480 resolution with a 16-bit color palette. And that was it. It's not very much. No graphics acceleration was allowed because Davis believed graphics encoding should be done out in the open rather than concealed away inside a GPU. Some sound was allowed in the form of an 8-bit single-voice MIDI controller, but it certainly wasn't what you would call immersive. Still, the operating system came with several hymns that Davis composed himself, and at least one of them is actually pretty catchy. In order to keep everything simple, small, and above all fast, most things were minimized to the extreme. For example, there was no calculator program, not because God expected you to be able to do complex mathematics in your head, but because the shell program was written in such a way that all you had to do was type your math problem into the command line and you would immediately get the answer. By today's modern operating system standard, the system was incredibly unforgiving when it came to security and making mistakes. Temple OS does not use memory protection. All code in the system runs at ring zero, the highest privilege level, meaning that a stray pointer write could easily crash the entire system. With any other operating system, such lack security would be unthinkable. However, because the temple was never designed to be connected to the internet or accessed remotely in any way, this approach actually simplified things a lot. Some have claimed that Davis simply lacked the necessary skills to change this. But not only is this obviously untrue, he made it very clear that the choice was deliberate, stating, It's fun having access to everything. When I was a teenager, I had a book, Mapping the Commodore 64, that told what every location in memory did. I liked copying the ROM to RAM and poking around at the ROM's basics variables. Now, Temple OS certainly had its limitations, but Davis did everything possible to ensure that anybody with a good imagination was able to do anything they wanted inside those fundamental limitations. Anybody who has an internet connection and knows how to run virtual machines can still download Temple OS free of charge from the official website, which is templeos.org. We are into the shadows recommend that any nerd with an afternoon to kill should do so. But for those of you still fond of, you know, going outside, touching grass, interacting with real people, God forbid, here are a few comments from experts who've carried out more extensive reviews than we did. CodersNotes.com said, Watching Temple OS execute its built-in test suite is a jaw-dropping experience. I can't help but be impressed as a vast number of demos, games, graphing calculators, debuggers, and compilers all fly before your eyes. To see the sheer amount of content that's been written here over the years, to see such effort expended on a labor of love, is wonderfully heartwarming. Some Ordinary Gamers has made two videos about Temple OS covering it in exceptional detail. Nobody can say that Terry Davis did not know what he was doing. You can't shit out a kernel, a compiler, an operating system, your own f***ing programming language, and then also a flight simulator if you weren't at least talented. And Terry, no one can take away from the fact that he was a very talented individual." End quote. Now, 
that last quote there may cause you to ask a few questions, perhaps the first one being, why would anybody be questioning Davis's abilities and talent at all? Clearly, his achievements speak for themselves, and had his mental health not deteriorated even further during 2017 and 2018, eventually leading to him being killed by a train whilst working on railway lines, could have gone on to do truly incredible things. Whilst all of that is undoubtedly true, there is another side to Terry Davis, a much darker side. You see, Davis had this terrible habit of saying some of the worst things that it's possible to say. Not only did he appear to be incredibly racist, but some of the things that he said could be construed as promoting or at least excusing underage sexual acts. You don't have to look very hard on the internet to find lists and lists of awful things he said, but we shall summarize a few of them here. CIA N-words glow in the dark. In one particularly infamous rant, Davis claimed that the agents of the CIA were black people who glow in the dark, and should you see such people when you are out and about, you should run them over. Because the internet is the internet and people are people, certain far-right groups quickly adopted this, and glowies quickly became the insult of choice on certain forums. Sticking with racism for just a moment more, he had what could only be described as an ungodly hatred for Linus Torvalds, the creator of Linux. During a telephone call he received in a live stream, he's heard to say the following, Hell no, I am a white man. I wrote my own compiler. I am not a N-word like Linus. I am a professional. But that's not all. Moving on to Davis's direct conversations with God provides us with some rather interesting insight. By the time Temple OS was released to the public, he and God had moved on to chatting about things outside of Temple Design. One such conversation, according to Davis, went like this. So, I asked God his favorite national anthem, and he said, Latvia's national anthem. What you have to understand is that God explained that when he judges a song, it's like having sex with a 12-year-old. That's what he wants out of a song. He doesn't want it sophisticated. When God listens to a song, what pleases him is sex with a 12-year-old. What the f***, dude? <laughs> this is only really scratching the surface, holy sh we could go on and on, but the chances of this video being monetizable are already pretty slim. Thanks, Dave, who ran today's episode. So we invite you to do your own research should you wish to dig a little deeper. It should suffice to say that in certain circles online, Davis was despised for his outbursts rather than venerated for his skills. As to whether he actually believed the things he was saying, or whether they were just a product of his schizophrenia and various other mental health problems, remains a topic of debate to this day. What we can say with absolute certainty, though, is that Terry Davis was a true genius and visionary. Whether or not he was getting his instructions directly from God himself is something we can never truly know. He wasn't. But we do know that he did something that nobody else has ever done. Yes, Temple OS is limited, and no one in their right mind would willingly switch to it as their day-to-day -day operating system, but people still do download it to this day. Even more surprising, there is a small but significant group of hobbyist programmers who have taken what Terry Davis built and expanded upon it. Now, if you know where to look, you can find versions with networking, extra gaming features, and even a Discord client. Terry Davis was a strange, troubled, and very often unpleasant individual. But he did do what he said he was going to do. Releasing an operating system containing all the features you advertise during the build is something that not even top software developers regularly manage, and for that, if nothing else, he does deserve to be remembered. Thank you for watching.